This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hi, Dr. Detail. Shh, there's no time. I'm finishing an experiment. Oh, cool. What are you testing? Something that's been bothering me for a while. What's that? Whether exposure time and gain matter for your subframes. Come here. Let me show you the results. I even have statistics. Oh, <laughs> that's really cool. I think people will be surprised. Welcome to Deep Sky Detail. Hi, so you may have heard that sub-exposure time doesn't really matter in terms of SNR or signal to noise ratio, but is this correct? I don't think it is. Well, it is and it isn't, and I'll show you why. In fact, I won't just show you, like, I'll actually do an experiment with real measurements and real numbers and real statistics. Really? Really? Really. Also, and I'm going to spoil a little of the results here, but you may be surprised to find out that just looking at two stacked images with your eyes to see a difference might deceive you. These type of comparison videos examining long and short exposure times might give you inaccurate beliefs about which exposure time is best. Before I begin, let me start out by saying I did a video on whether stacking increases signal or decreases noise. In that video, I showed with a perfect camera and with perfect conditions, the sub-exposure length doesn't matter. 100 one-second subs are, with a perfect camera, equivalent to one 100-second sub. But I also said that it is an approximation and that the two are not equivalent in real life. Why? Well, we don't measure things with a perfect camera. We have to deal with read noise, light pollution noise, and other things. Then, a couple of weeks ago, I saw this presentation on the Astro Imaging channel by Tim Hutchinson on noise. It's really good. I'd recommend taking a look. He did say some things that I'm not 100% sure about though. More on that at the end of the video. I'd like to experimentally test what he said over a couple of videos. This is one of the things he said. Consider read noise and shot noise as our exposure gets brighter, i.e. as we take a longer exposure, our read noise becomes less and less significant. Here, it's not changing our final number at all. But anyway, the takeaway here is not so much about read noise, but more about what our minimum exposure needs to be, right? So what Tim is getting at here is that if you have really short exposures, the read noise from your camera on each subframe is going to be greater as a proportion of your overall signal than with a longer exposure. At this point, I think I need to make something really clear. Definitions matter. In this video, signal means the average light coming from a deep sky target. Noise is anything that messes up that signal. Noise is random variation due to your camera's read noise, variation from the deep sky object itself, random photons from light pollution, etc. And the big thing we need to talk about is signal to noise ratio or SNR. In some videos, people talk about signal and signal to noise ratio interchangeably. I'll try not to. Signal to noise ratio is just the ratio of the signal divided by the noise. It is not the signal, it is not the noise stacking increases the signal to noise ratio. What stacking does to signal and what it does to noise is up for debate depending on your philosophy. I did a three video series on it. You should watch it. It's really good if I do say so myself. But here's the critical thing. Stacking either increases signal and increases noise or it averages signal and decreases noise. Stacking does not and cannot simultaneously increase signal and decrease noise. Watch the three-part video series. It explains the math. To sum up those videos, if you think stacking increases signal, then it also increases noise. But the noise does not increase nearly as fast as the signal. The signal-to-noise ratio, or SNR, increases. If you personally think that stacking averages signal, then your signal gets more constant and your noise decreases. Subsequently, the SNR increases. The math in both instances is exactly the same. The philosophy you choose is just you arbitrarily deciding what you think should be in the numerator and denominator of the SNR calculation. Okay, tangent over. So the focus of this first video is to determine if sub-exposure length matters. Additionally, I want to see if gain and read noise matter. In this video, Tim also said this. We already proved a few slides ago that we don't care what the read noise is. 
So push the gain down, expose for a longer period of time. Is this true? I'm not sure it is for every single camera. Look at the read noise graph for my ZWO294MM camera. It has two gain modes. Once you get to unity gain, the read noise drops and the dynamic range increases back to 13 stops, even though the full well depth is lower. I'm thinking that technically, for my camera at least, read noise might matter a little bit. Thus, unity gain will give you better SNR. I 100% agree with Tim though, that there is a minimum exposure time you need in order to get the best SNR that you can. So I'm going to do a classic two by two experiment to find out if I'm correct. My hypotheses are this. Using unity gain, at least for my camera, is better than low gain settings. And having too short of a sub exposure will result in less SNR than a longer one. Keep in mind that choosing a good sub-exposure length also depends on how good your tracking is and things like that. So life is complicated and that's okay. We can still test things, create models, and learn new stuff even if it isn't a complete picture. That's science. So real quick, what equipment am I using? I've got a 6-inch Rigi Creation at a focal length of 1,370 millimeters. Attached is my ZWO294MM Pro camera on an Orion Sirius mount. I'll be using an off-axis guider. My target is Messier 101. How will I do the test? Well, as I said before, it's a classic two by two experiment, meaning I have four different types of sub-exposures. Two of the types of sub-exposures will be 120 seconds long, and the other two will be 15 seconds. Additionally, two of the sub-exposure types will have a gain of 10, and two others will have a gain of 121 almost unity gain. So we have four total conditions, and each condition has a unique combination of sub-exposure length and gain. Note that 15 seconds at the F ratio of the RC should not be adequate to allow the signal from M101 to overcome the read noise. Eight times longer at 120 seconds should be at least better. <laughs> so how did I take the sub-exposures? Did I do four nights of imaging with each night a different type of sub-exposure? Long-time viewers of this channel know that the answer is no. That would be silly. How could I control the humidity on different nights? How could I control the high-level clouds each night? Well, I can't. What I did was systematically alternate between 15-second subs, 120-second subs, 10 gain, and 121 gain each imaging session. For example, I take a 120-second sub at 10 gain, then a 120 second sub at 121 gain, then eight 15 second subs at 10 gain, then eight 15 second subs at 121 gain, then I take 120 second sub at 10 gain, and then eight 15 second subs at 10 gain, etc. Systematically alternating this way should help minimize the effects of atmosphere on, on the different types of subframes, and it should help minimize the effects of guiding gremlins and, uh, and other things. This is the way. I ended up shooting over 10 nights and got about 40 minutes of integration time for each type of sub-exposure. So what did I find? All right, I ran some statistics on this and I trust the statistics. I'm going to show you the results visually first. You might be surprised that what your eyes see might not match the statistics. Here are the four stacks, with each stack having 40 minutes of exposure time. Each stack has only had an auto stretch applied with no other processing. Can you tell the difference? Well, this one looks the worst and it's not even close. The others look kind of similar, but which one has the best signal to noise ratio and which image belongs to which condition? I'll come back to matching the stacked images with the signal to noise ratios later. To test the signal to noise ratio, I took the core of Messier 101 and divided it up into 121 equal sections or samples. I then measured the signal to noise ratio for each sample in each of the four stacks. Each of the four stacks were aligned in serial. You know, this took a lot of work. You might consider subscribing if you haven't yet. I'd appreciate it. With only 40 minutes of exposure and a relatively slow scope like the 6 inch RC, if I average all the stacked image samples together, the SNR is about 6. But we don't care about the overall sample. We want to know how sub-exposure length affects SNR and gain, and whether there's some sort of synergistic effect between exposure length and gain on the signal to noise ratio. To test all that stuff, I put the data into a thing called a Bayesian model. 
It's just some fancy statistics that can help sort out the individual effects of gain and sub-exposure time on SNR. In other words, I'm trying to predict SNR of M101 with my setup based on the sub-exposure length and the gain settings. So what did I find? Well, before we get into that, let's talk about statistics a little bit. With statistics and statistical models, you're always comparing different hypotheses. It's a different way of thinking about things. One thing to get started in statistics is with this video's sponsor, Brilliant. In this video, I'm basically comparing several statistical models using Bayesian methods. I really like Bayesian thinking because you can quantify your uncertainty based on what you already know. In Brilliant, there is a course called Bayesian Probability. As someone who has had a lot of experience creating Bayesian models, I think Brilliant does a great job at introducing us to the topic. You will learn key concepts related to information theory, Bayesian inference, and causal Bayesian networks. You'll get hands-on experience working on relatable problems, not just memorizing formulas and flowcharts. It takes time to learn, and Brilliant can help you practice a little bit every day using fun examples. Before you know it, you'll develop a powerful learning habit. If Bayes is a bit too advanced, don't worry. There is an introduction to probability course that leads right into it. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash deep sky detail or click the link in the description. You'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So for my particular setup, sub exposure length really mattered. Like it's not even a question. The statistical model is screaming, you got more SNR with 120 second subs than 15 second ones. Basically the 15 second subs averaged about four SNR. While the 120 second subs averaged eight SNR. <laughs> Pretty wild. Sub exposure time really does matter. If it isn't long enough, the read noise will be too strong in each sub exposure and you'll get a worse image. But what about gain? Well, the model isn't exactly screaming at us here, but it is saying something. Gain does matter. It matters for both long and short sub exposures, but its effect isn't super big. The subs with 10 gain had about five and a half SNR, while the subs with 121 gain had about 6.8 SNR. Was there any synergistic effect of gain and exposure length on SNR? No, not according to the model. So basically the effects of sub exposure length and gain were kind of independent of each other. And that's good because I don't actually have an a priori reason for why there should be some weird interaction between the two variables. So what's the key takeaway? Too short of an exposure length gives you worse signal to noise ratio. Not using unity gain with a 294mm pro camera in bin 2x2 mode is a bit worse too but not nearly as bad as having a short exposure. Let's look at the stacked images again. Not surprisingly, this image that looks the worst is the 15 second 10 gain exposure. And here are the exposure times and gain settings for the other three. They actually look quite similar to each other, yet these longer exposures are definitely better based on the statistics. So what's going on? Well, first of all, let's get this out of the way. Sometimes your eyes aren't the best judge of things, especially when comparing two images side by side. Here's an example. This left square has 10 dots. The bottom left one has 20 dots. You can definitely tell without counting that there is a difference in the number of dots. This top right square has 110 dots and the bottom right one has 120 but I couldn't tell you which one has more just by looking at it. It's the same with these four images. We can clearly see that the top left one is worse than the others, but these other three look similar. The two on the right will get us a decent signal to noise ratio much more quickly than the bottom left one will. If you get 10 hours of data instead of 40 minutes, you might end up with a clear winner. The 120 second subs might look much better. The difference might get exaggerated as you stack, but you can't necessarily tell that by looking at a stack of just one hour of data. And that's where the power of doing an actual experiment with actual statistics shines. I don't have to give a hand wavy answer at the end of this video that says they look similar. I'll let you decide which one is the best. No, the answer is clear. Having an exposure length that overcomes the read noise is much better 
than shorter subs. But are 10 minute subs better than two minute ones, even if the two minute ones have sufficiently overcome the read noise? Tim Hutchinson also said in the Astro Imaging Channel's video that, and I'm paraphrasing what I think his opinion is, that a long sub exposure like 10 minutes would be better than a two minute one, even if the two minute one has overcome the read noise. Image, right? We need to make sure that we're above those minimums. But the real question is how long can I go? Because remember, the longer we expose, the greater impact we have on our shot noise for every single frame. And then as we stack those frames, to drive that noise down away from the signal that we've captured, right? So in my opinion, I, would, I do not follow the advice of some that suggests that, hey, these CMOS cameras are so great that we can take really short exposures and get a great image. You can get an image, but I suggest, I humbly suggest that you won't get a great image, right? And the better images will come when we when we make that target signal as bright as we can. To In all honesty, I don't think this is entirely correct. I like experiments like this one I did on how filters affect signal. I think I'll do one on very long exposures versus normal ones. But that's a video for another day. And thanks for watching. <laughs>